Uh, so, uh, morning guys, it's, uh, just come back from my uh, morning walk, I usually go for a walk, nice brisk walk, uh, every day if I can, you know. Um, so yeah, I've done a video the other day, uh, first video for quite a while, so got some nice messages there, um, uh, one from Seb, it's Seb's Random Space, uh, it's a little channel that I watch little bits of wildlife there and animals uh, and various stuff on that channel but he was saying about um, how I've been very lucky you know talking about um, the guy Bernie Travis you know that uh, became my cellmate I mean come on yeah I have been very lucky in my life you know uh, my sister's husband calls me leprechaun you know uh, Sean the Leprechaun, and it does seem like I have led a charmed life, uh, you know, I'm still alive, obviously, uh, after all the scrapes that I've been in, but, uh, you know, you can imagine at the time, you know, when I was banged up with Bernie Travis, that's actually his name, it's not Bernie Travis, it's Bernie Travis, I can't even remember his first name, uh, it was that long ago, uh, he had a double-barreled surname, but uh, you can imagine, you know, there's me, 24 years old, right into heroin, you know, and heroin is a bird killer. It kills the, the time in prison, you know, because uh, you're sort of wrapped in cotton wool and you just get on with it and you sleep or gouge out, you know, the days just pass and the time goes quick. But obviously when you're in withdrawal, <laughs> it goes like a thousand times slower. But uh, yeah, so Vernie Travis, you know, imagine that there's me always looking for heroin and that, you know, and I'm getting a new cell mate and I'm about to say I don't want him in my cell because, you know, just by, I was obviously a bit judgmental back then and I was young, obviously I'm not like that now, but uh, my mate, well, Danny Brennan, changed my mind and said, yeah, I know of this guy, keep him as a cell mate and it turned out, you know, he had a kilo of heroin for his own personal use, you know, so like I say, yeah, he was minted on the out, you know, he's from a wealthy uh, upper middle class family, you know, and uh, he wasn't very streetwise. And uh, obviously, I looked after him in that respect, you know, and uh, like I say, a heroin, a uh, kilo of heroin back then, God, you're, you're talking 30, 40,000 to buy it, you know, let alone the amount it would have been worth. Uh, if it was done out in bags, you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds, you know, so this guy's got this just to see him through his uh, six year sentence. I think that's what he was doing, a five or a six year, uh, if I remember rightly, you know, so um, I'm going to get on with that story and uh, talk about some other stuff as well. Um, I did want to go back to the time when I was a juvenile, you know, and uh, I remember when I was doing, I was looking at my... Uh, Acro and all an acro is it's just your pre cons, you know. If you're in a prison, you know, and you're going up to court, you'll have copies of your previous convictions, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And that's all that acro is it's just your previous convictions if you've got any, and it's nothing else. And also, it's just previous convictions, and I think it's uh arrests and no further actions and that's about it so yeah i wanted to talk about transports the old prison transports you know when you watch films and that you know especially in america you see these guys they get on coaches and buses and they're they're all um cuffed up to each other you know to another con you know and obviously prison transports you know um that like that on on a coach being cuffed to another inmate that's only happened to me once and that was as a juvenile uh when i was going from chelmsford prison which had a white uh young offenders wing uh would have been about 86 to rochester and uh, like i said before i was in there for uh dishonesty crimes and uh what had happened uh I think I'd jump bow or something or other like that and uh, I'd got reminded in custody or something like that and what had happened I spent a few months on remand and then uh, you know a few months on remand at Ashford in Middlesex and like I say you know the transport then was done by the police 
not the uh, prison service. It was done by the police and not by private people from the courts. You know, uh, inter internal transports between prisons uh, was done by the prison service unless you was uh, an A-category prisoner and it would be done by the police, you know, with the helicopters and all that. Um, so, yeah, where was I? Uh, Ashford. So the remand centre Ashford, you know, uh, you'd go there in a sweat box. And I remember uh, as soon as I got convicted, well, uh, I hadn't been sentenced, but I'd been convicted uh, after court, you know, it was by Lambeth holding cells, then back to Ashford Remand Centre, which is opposite Feltham. Uh, Feltham, there used to be an old Feltham ball stall, the new Feltham, which is not new now, is it? It was built in the 80s. I've been in there as well. Um, it's still there, but Ashford isn't. So, uh, yeah, uh, I remember I was getting convicted. I'd been convicted, but not sentenced. So because of that, I spent another couple of days at Ashford and then was moved in a sweat box uh, to um, Chelmsford in Essex. And uh, I was only there for a few weeks uh, in a three-up cell, but there was only two of us in there. Uh, I was banged up with this guy called Lenny, who was... I was about 16, I think he was about 20, because it was for YPs then, or young offenders, was for the ages of 15 to 21. Although some guys, when they got to like 18, 19, if they was too much for uh, to handle, they'd be moved to a man's prison, you know. I've been in pl plenty of prisons, even Belmarsh and stuff, and Wandsworth, where there's 18 year olds in there, you know, where, uh, uh, they couldn't cope with them in young offenders, so they had to go to a man's prison. So yeah, um, but the thing I want to talk about is, yeah, so from Chelmsford, uh, and this is uh, the only time this happened, we was moved by the prison services, I was moved because I was only there for a few weeks, I'm jr I still haven't been sentenced, so I'm going to Rochester now, they just come and said, in the morning, pack your kit, you're going. But uh, the thing was, and then this is the first time, or well, the only time this has ever happened, uh, it wasn't on a sweat box. We was all put on to all the other bods, all the other cons that were being moved from Chelmsford to Rochester. We was all put on a coach and, uh, you know, like a normal coach. It would have been one of them coaches, you know, like the old school trick coaches in the 80s. And... Uh, and we'd all get on there in our old prison jeans, you remember them old blue shirts? the blue pinstripe shirts and the old blue jeans, you know, swinging around your ankles and these horrible black plastic shoes you used to wear, you know, and so we're all going on there and we're getting cuffed up, you know, in the prison handcuffs are like these uh, old style iron handcuffs, you know, and uh, if you've got skinny wrists like me and I was only about eight stone, eight and a half stone then when I was that age, uh, so I was pretty skinny and they, they put the blocks in there and you get cuffed up to the guy you're going to be sitting next to on the journey. And so, yeah, basically, you know, you maybe have a chat with uh, the guy you're sitting next to or whatever. You know, find out what they're in for or they might ask you and all that sort of stuff. You know, because uh, like I say, YP's a lot different from a man's prison. Me certainly preferred man's prison. Uh, um, when I first went to a Young Offenders at 16, uh, a lot of the guys in there, you know, at that age, at the age of 15, 16, 17, the younger ages are quite immature, you know, and uh, me, uh, I, I like to think of myself as mentally uh, a lot older than my years, uh, you know, uh, I used to like to think, I, was, I used to read and try and educate myself because I didn't have a decent education and I've continued with that throughout my life, you know, just trying to better myself. Uh, that's why I still watch stuff now, you know, about science, the universe and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so where is we going? Yeah. So yeah, that time, uh, young offenders, I think, uh, so yeah, then I was taken to Rochester and then eventually from Rochester, I started going back to court again and got sentenced. But when I got sentenced, I got an 18 month supervision order because I'd done a few months on remand, you know, so yeah, I was quite lucky there again. 
Um, right, so yeah, back to the story that I was doing a couple of days ago with Bernie Travis. So yeah, you know, how lucky was I, you know? I get a cellmate, he's really generous, you know? Uh, if he wants someone to help him out, and he's got a kilo of heroin, you know? So yeah, but it didn't last that long. It lasted a few months, not the past that we had, I mean, the, the few months that I was getting visits for him and getting it up for him and all that, you know? And uh, like I said, I was sorting out the right people, like I said. It wasn't, you know, I was getting this for nothing as well. Uh, well, I say nothing, but there's a mental stress of it all, you know, people trying to get it off you all the time or trying to rob you. And that didn't happen to me, but like I said in the other video, when I was moved to the Sea Wing to get my uh, home leave, you know, you've got to remember I would have been going out on home leave and getting my own parcels. Plus, I was also having my own visits, getting my own things. Nothing like the amount that he had, but, you know, it was good enough for me. So, uh, yeah, what happened with Bernie Travis? Basically, uh, when I moved, everyone started tearing the arse out of him. Uh, those guys, uh, Fiddler and Slim and Chippy, uh, got hold of him. And then what happened? There was some trouble over uh, another guy called Rab, a Scottish guy came and uh, he piled up with Ernie Travis and this rap guy started um, looking after him, you know, like he sort of bouncer or whatever. I mean, I remember a few time, days before the home leave, I went over there to try and get a sort out, saying, you know, I'm going. And you got to remember, I've been getting doing everything for this guy for months and I thought, well, you know, surely he'll sort me out and uh, I'll pay him back when I get my home leave. So I went over there and I've mentioned this before, and that rab day come from Norwich, Scottish guy, he just looked like a right old skaghead, really, you know, uh, six foot two something, you know, quite lean looking, teeth missing and all that, just looked like some Scottish junkie. But uh, yeah, basically, you know, I'm about two days away or a day away from my home leave, I'm getting the first three days out, first time I would have been out for a couple of years. And uh, I don't want to mess this up, you know, by getting nicked or anything, you know. Because if you get nicking in there just before your home leave, you know, you know your home leave is going to be cancelled and all that. So uh, basically what happened, I've gone over there and uh, asked for any Travis for a sort out. And he's saying he hasn't got anything, you know, he's sitting there, his eyes are all pinned up. And when I say pinned up. I mean, it's called being pinned up because your pupils on your eyes, when you take opiates, constrict. They go really tiny, and that, that's what you get a lot of people in there. They start looking at your eyes, you know, to see if your eye, your your, your uh, pupils are really small and constricted. Hence the term uh, pinned up or piss holes in the snow, you know. Um, so basically, yeah, he was out of his night lying on his bed. He's saying, I haven't got anything and all that. You know, and this is a bit out of order, and but his cupboard was open. You, like I said, you got these little cupboards in there with a key. It was open and it was full of uh, gold Virginia and old open, you know, the little half ounce packets and that. And uh, I said, oh, I'm really sick. I'm going home, leave. I'm getting a bag and I, I need to get a bag and that. And basically what I did, um, you know, this is not really my style. I took a couple of ounces of backy out of his cupboard and said, look, I'll get one with this and I'll sort you out when I come back, you know, and then walked out of the cell, you know, a bit out of character for me, you know, but this stuff does happen. So basically, yeah, uh, uh, as I'm going out of the cell, that rab's come back, right? And he said, what are you doing going in there, wrestling him and all that? I said, I don't know what you're talking about, mate, you know, and as I was going to walk out the gate, because it's like a corridor and there's an iron gate at the end, he banged me in the mouth, right? And I thought, you know what? I could have a fight with this guy, you know what I mean? I don't think I'm hard or anything, but if someone starts on me, this is a general rule for my life, I, I will fight back. There was a couple of times in my life where I didn't fight back and I still regret that now, you know, or I was too ill to fight back. Uh, that happened once a few years ago in Rose Hill where someone weighed me in, but like I say, I only had the use of one leg. Uh, I had all sorts of illnesses, gallstones. I was in a terrible state. It was all bloated up, and, you know, this guy, I basically let him weigh me in, you know, and he went a bit over the top, 
you know, but uh, that wouldn't be happening again, I can tell you that now, because uh, my health is not that as bad as what it was when I was on all those drugs. So like I say, this uh, rab, yeah, he smacked me in the mouth, and it was like a little, uh, you know, I didn't even feel it, you know, it didn't, it was nothing, and I thought, you know what, in my head I thought, you know, I could probably do this guy, and then all the screws would be up here, because there's a lot of snitches in High Point North, and uh, they're always close by, you know, screws office is only underneath on the ones, and uh, I thought, fuck it, I'm meant to be getting out tomorrow, you know, and I walked off with the tobacco, which I still got, and uh, went back to my wing. So when I went on my home leave, uh, you know, because I had a few debts to pay back, Big H, on Hilton, uh, Hilton, Headley, there, I, had to, I owed him. Uh, he'd been sorting me out a few bags, and he wanted me to go and get in some hash, which I did, you know, and brought that back, and a parcel of heroin, and... Uh, yeah, so what happened, about, uh, when, I, when I was back with my parcel, Bernie Travis came up to the window of my cell, you know, and it was very unusual for him to even go off the wing, you know, he was that paranoid about people harassing him or attacking him. You know, uh, you would have had this guy, he actually looked like a bit of a bacon, to be honest with you, even though he wasn't, you know. You know, uh, it's one thing I've learned, you can't judge people on appearances. So yeah, he's come out to the window and said, uh, uh, Sean, sort us out. I said, hold on, mate. Do you know what I mean? After all that, what happens? You, you, I nearly lost my home leave. You're getting your little, your stupid mate to smack me in the mouth. Yeah. And then leaving me sick and all that and making me, well, not making me rob you for a couple of ounces. You know, I told him what's what. And I said, look, I'm still going to sort you out. So basically, I'm in the cell there with me, Del Kinsella, and Danny Brandon, you know, and I, I sorted him out, uh, a few bags, a few prison bags, you know. That was the least I could do for him, because at the end of the day, you know, I did take a little bit of a libby there, and I felt sorry for him, and he went back to the wing. But uh, what happened to him was... Um, uh, Eventually, uh, he got moved, you know, it was just mayhem, uh, always fighting and all that, and, you know, he got proper robbed a couple of times. I see him with a few black eyes a couple of times, you know. Uh, you know, um, he used to, if someone was robbing him, rather than fight back, he'd go into the toilet and fucking get the parcel out. Like, he, I don't know, I'm pretty sure he was gay. Uh, he never actually came out with it. Uh, he had some... You know, uh, but he probably was, and I don't know, maybe he got off on that sort of stuff, you know. To me, something like that, people doing that is the worst thing that could happen to you, and, uh, you know, like people going near your private parts and that, mate. Ah, oh. do you know what I mean? I just wouldn't entertain none of that stuff, mate, no fucking way. Do you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, sadly, that shit goes on, you know. Uh, people were um, taking parcels out of people's uh, bottle, out of their bum holes and stuff, you know, it's not good, it does go on there, but, uh, you know, if someone's going to go, how can they report that happening? They can't really, can they? Because then if they report it, then they're, they're um, incriminating themselves by, you know, because they've got drugs in the prison, which is an offence in itself, so it's a very, you know, taboo subject. But like I say, I know a few people that it's happened to though, usually smaller guys or guys that don't really, wouldn't fight back, you know, because you've got to remember the people doing all these robberies of people in there, they're people that have got no one, they can't, you know what I mean, they do it not on their own usually, usually a few of them, do you know what I mean, they can't fight on their own in a straightener, do you know what I mean, so yeah, but I am definitely not into all that stuff. Uh, you know, I don't agree with that. But, uh, like I say, sadly, that does go on in there. Anyway, guys, uh, I just want to say thanks to everyone that's been leaving them nice comments and that. And, uh, yeah, I'll be up soon, but probably not next month uh, because I've got a lot to do uh, with possibly moving flat and all that sort of stuff. Like I said before, I um, will be going back up to London 
soon, hopefully. I was meant to go last year, but it didn't happen. So hopefully, touch wood, it will be this year. Um, yeah, those little things you do in your own head, you know, like touch wood. I remember uh, when I was a kid, my mum, you know, because my nan was a bit, was a, 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 a Romany gypsy, and my mum used to say, oh, bat magpies are bad luck and all that, you know. And I remember, I was in Iodown once, because I used to see magpies, if I was going on a bit of work, I'd see a magpie, I'd be, oh, you know, that could be bad luck and all that, you know. Obviously, I was as, uh, you know, now I know that's complete rubbish, but back then, you know, when your mind's all over the place. And uh, I remember I was getting this, I was in prison in Iodan, I see this guy I knew, uh, Stevie, Stevie Aldo, he's dead now, sadly, and uh, he said to me, you know what you got to do, Sean? If you see a magpie, you got to go, Aye aye captain, and that reverses any of the bad luck. And I thought, I burst out laughing, because I thought, ah, oh. no, but what happened was, when I did eventually get out, and I was back at it again, and I see a magpie, and I found myself going, aye aye captain, to these magpies, you know, in my head, not saying it out loud. So yeah, a little funny bit there, but uh, yeah, that's it guys. Uh, like I say, um, I want to say thanks to the people leaving the comments and that and all the people that watch. I don't get a lot of views for these stories, but the people that are watching are good stuff for being very loyal to the channel, you know. Uh, so, yeah, that's it, guys, and uh, hopefully be up next month. Cheers.